Good and read. Good. Good. <laughs> yes. Oh, we say we say the same thing in France. They do. Well, mm -hmm. maybe not we an angel. It might be a ghost. But either way. So I mean, it just went by. Do you need her to have a mic? Yeah. Oh, I do need a mic. And yep. the microphone is not for this room, so you won't hear me projected. It's oh. only for global, so. We need to talk. It's going to feel weird because it's mm -hmm. not projecting my voice in this room, but it's on. So uh, thank you all for being here. I feel like it's a presidential debate or something. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's just floating, floating through my head. Well, five so, women debating we have, we have, for president. That would be a good day. Tough questions well, I for you. That <laughs> <laughs> would that would be amazing to have to have these five. Mm -hmm. uh, before we introduce our wonderful panelists, we're going to start with just really brief introductions of every, everybody who's in the room here. We won't introduce everybody on Global, but we have a, a number of audience members on Global as well. And uh, yeah, we'll go around and just say if you're an AFW officer and what your unit is, just really briefly. So I'm Ann Cox, and I am the current AFW president. Ana Maria Rodriguez Vivaldi, and I'm part of AFW officers, and I'm in charge of the Sam Smith Award. Amanda Hussein. I am a graduate student in the School of Languages, Cultures, and Race in American Studies, and I just became a brand new AFW member tonight. So, <laughs> yay! <laughs> Kathleen Rogers, I'm with the Department of Human Development, and I'm a co officer for the um, graduate scholarships. I'm Carrie Cutler in psychology, and I do membership and outreach with AFW. I'm Elizabeth Canning in psychology, and I'm new faculty. I'm Melissa in music and program co-chair for AFW. Miranda Bernhardt from the Center for Reproductive Biology. Lisa Gloss, graduate school in molecular biosciences. Hi, I'm Jen Sherman. I'm in sociology, and I'm the AFW secretary. Hi, I'm Ashley Boyd. I'm in the Department of English, and I'm AFW caterer. Hi, I'm Robin Bond uh, from Honors College. Lorena O. English from the Libraries. Uh, Chelsea Leachman from the Libraries and um, President-elect for AFW. Donna Potts, Chair of English. Sue Gill, Chair of Accounting. Hey, we have a couple more people coming in, but we'll go ahead and, and get started without Further ado, I think. So I'm going to hand it over to Ana Maria. Ana Maria really was the one who conceived of this idea and kind of structured the, uh, the objectives of this event and how it would all play out. So she was the visionary, and I'll let you introduce the panelists, and then I will help facilitate some of the questions, which will integrate with audience questions as well. So I just want to just name who's here, and I think most of us uh, know our panelists and know them very well. And First of all, we're very happy that, to have you here and, and we're very grateful as well. And I just wanted to let you know, both the panelists and the, and the uh, attendants here in, uh, in, in Pullman, that we have over 50 people uh, joining us mm -hmm. through the kind services of our global uh, campus uh, colleagues who facilitated this. Thank you very much. And welcome to all those people on our other campuses as well. So today, I'm, I'm just going to briefly introduce our panelists. I'm not going to read their bios. They're online and also on a, a handout that we have. But uh, it, we are very pleased to introduce Dr. Noel Schultz. She's our WSU First Lady. But uh, most important for us also, she's a professor in the Edmund on Tricer uh, III Chair uh, over at the Voiland College of Engineering and Architecture. Then uh, she will be followed by Dr. Melanie Nui. She's an associate professor in criminal justice and criminology, uh, but she's also uh, working as an interim associate vice for the facu for faculty development. So she plays an important part as well in, in what we are and what we want to do. And then we have Dr. Kearney Meehan, and she's an associate dean in the research, in, uh, and she's in charge of research and grad studies at the College of Arts and Sciences, and she's also an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology. 
Then we have Dr. Monica Johnson, who's the chair of sociology, and she do, conducts a lot of research that also has to do with women and very, very, interest, <coughs> very interested in diversity issues. And then we have Dr. Zoe High Eagle Strong. She's the executive director of tribal relations and special assistant to the provost, and she's also director of the Center for Native American Research and Collaboration. Mm -hmm. Welcome all, to all of you, and thank you for being here. So we have about an hour or so for the main program here, and hopefully we'll have a lot of discussion, and then followed by dinner. So we hope that many of you will stay for dinner for more interaction, more discussion uh, following the main event here. So just to begin, and then um, I will be asking for more audience questions at certain points as well, but we would like to begin by asking the panelists to take two to three minutes each, so you each have kind of an introductory period and you have the floor for each of you to talk a little bit about one or two skills that you learned along the way that helped you succeed. So basically, things that were really instrumental in helping you get where you are today, but keeping it relatively brief as we move through. I don't know which end we want to start at, or we can start in the middle. You know, I think Everybody's pointing at Noel. <laughs> <laughs> Noel, sure. you're on. Thank you. I just want to look at my we phone. We won't time you, but oh, no, you know, I'm we might. timing myself. So, um, <laughs> So uh, good evening, thanks for being here. Um, uh, I was trying to think of one or two skills that I've learned along the way that helped me succeed. And um, when I was thinking about that in both my positions when I've been associate dean and some other positions at, univers at a university, but also my volunteer position, I was president of my professional society in 2012 and 2013, the second woman president of electrical engineers. So. Um, with about 35,000 members worldwide. So some of that is both with, with my day job as well as the volunteer, because a lot of us do volunteer work like AFW. I think that the first thing I learned is it's better to over communicate than under communicate. Um, I think that's one thing that um, sometimes leaders uh, think everybody knows everything and, and we don't um, know everything. Uh, the other thing is PES uh, president, I learned that Leading volunteers is a lot different than leading employees. So um, it's very challenging to fire a volunteer, and not that you want to fire employees, but there's a process with that, but when people are volunteering. And I think the other thing I learned, which was probably the biggest thing, is um, not everyone sees the world and likes and thinks th exactly like me. And um, not everybody wants to spend all their time and energy on things, the same things I want to do. And I think, what, what I learned in that and what I took away from that was the fact of understanding my spheres of influence and what I could impact and what I couldn't impact. And I think that was a big discovery for me because I would get upset of things that were outside my control and I would just get all flustered about them and I couldn't change them because someone else wasn't gonna do something. I had to only do what I could help control and that was a big moment for me when I learned that what can I influence and what can I not? And then I focus on the things I can influence and not the things I can influence because that's really wasted time. So those were a couple of things that uh, I thought about in, when, with this question. Thanks, Noel. Is this close enough? Um, thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Things that I've learned. Um, so. I've now learned more things <laughs> <laughs> because I think those things are definitely very true. Um, I Hold would say, are mics on? Yes. yes. Okay, you can okay, hear us. We're okay, we're good. Okay. okay. Um, I would add, or I would maybe go in a slightly different direction, and um, some of the things that I've learned um, throughout my career here in informal or formal leadership positions um, are that you should um, trust yourself to know that you're gonna know, like you're gonna know what to do, and even if you don't know what to do, you're gonna figure it out. Um, so I think that's been kind of a, a, a big kind of empowering lesson that you don't have to wait until someone comes and tells you how to do things, and you can trust yourself to figure it out. Um, and you can trust yourself to have what it takes, even if it isn't I mean, as women, we usually think that we're not qualified, and I'm not saying that I am, and 
whether or not I'm qualified, you know, I have to trust that I can do these things. Um, and the other thing um, that I've discovered, and I, it's something that I've believed for a long time, but I've truly come to um, embrace it and really apply it because it's become more and more apparent that it was very necessary, is to know why you're, why you're doing what you're doing. Um, that if you don't know your why, then nothing is gonna be easy and nothing is gonna happen and fall into place. Uh, it's gonna be kind of a challenge and a struggle. But if you know your why, I mean, I'm not saying it's gonna be easy and there won't be a challenge because there definitely will be, but it will make the challenges worth it. And also, it will make you a better fit for what you're doing, right? And it'll allow you to uh, make the decisions you know, that you need to make if you know your why. So these are my two things. Um, hi, thank you uh, for inviting me tonight. Uh, I'm also excited to be here. And um, I would say uh, the two things, one um, would be, you know, just to actually following up a little bit on what Melanie just said, is to, you know, feel that you have the, the power to create your position and your job and, and to feel confident in going out and making it what you want it to be. Um, and then in terms of some lessons or learned or skills that I've learned along the way as well, um, I've spent much of my career uh, working uh, internationally um, and around the world. And I think that, um, I think that has definitely uh, provided me with some skills just in terms of being able to sit back and listen um, and uh, hear uh, what people are saying. And maybe that's a skill I'm actually still trying to develop and learn, because I'm certainly not perfect at that. But trying to listen and hear what uh, people are saying uh, before jumping in. And so that's probably a skill I'm still working on, but one that uh, I think that uh, I focused on coming from my research and then moving into leadership. So I'd say those two things. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I think this is great that we're having this conversation, so I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, the two things that I think I would say I learned uh, and that I try to implement in my position are, are related to the things that have come up so far. My first is that a conversation goes a long, long, long way. and. Uh, I usually think of it as an in-person conversation, but with our multi-campus system, that's sometimes a phone, but it's not email. Um, and um, that's one where I have to sometimes relearn. <laughs> um, but it's, it's something I engage frequently when something's going to be happening. And sometimes it's because, oops, there it goes. I need to have a face-to-face -face conversation. And everything that I, I worry will get big um, or starts to get big, it is so much easier, and maybe it matches my skill set, or maybe there's inherent things in that, but we're all a little bit more reasonable when we're talking to another person instead of a machine. Um, so that's one that I think is really critical. And then the other one I would say, um, and it relates to your what's the why, is having a really good sense of my own values and remembering that other people have them too. Um, and so uh, a lot of the conflict resolution that I do involves finding out what it is that someone cares about because we're upset because something we care about is threatened or damaged or something like that, right? And it's usually something that we would all agree is a valid value, right? If we can get to the heart of that, sometimes it just opens up a lot more solutions because the thing that is being disagreed about or you know, under attack isn't really what is at issue. What is at issue is some, something really, you know, something closely held. Um, if it's fairness or if it is I'm worthy or any of those things um, it, when you can get at that. So as I've taken different roles, I've thought about what is it that's really important to me because I'm going to have to justify my decisions and sometimes I'm going to have to make hard choices. And um, if it's tough, it's probably because there's some things that are, you know, pulling some, some values that are in conflict. And if I have a good sense of what mine are, it helps me make those decisions. It helps me explain my decisions to other people, helps me get input in the right way. So I would say those are my, my two things that I've learned. Great, thanks. Uh, Tats Halawit. Um, my name is Zoe Hayegel-Strong, as you mentioned before. And um, some of the 
areas that have really driven, I think, my leadership or helped support my leadership is um, valuing uh, relationships, valuing team, and valuing community. And previous, um, before I uh, began working here at WSU, I was an executive director for a nonprofit worldwide organization, and then also started a nonprofit um, that's been running now for 15 years um, that serves Northwest youth and adolescent. And I think what I realized over time is how much we need relationships. Um, one, when we have a vision or we're motivated, um, we can't do things alone. Um, and building relationships where I've always been committed to wherever I go, whether I'm in the communities or the schools, um, trying to build relationships without an agenda um, and just getting to know people, listening, hearing, um, getting to know adolescents and youth and what they need. And um, really because of that, I think that's often um, driven the work that I'm passionate about. It, it led me to go back to school. Um, I ended up getting my PhD at University of Washington and, um, just because you know I was a part of a team and, and we lacked um, some really core tenets of, um, <coughs> in our nonprofit of evaluation and, and we saw that there were systematic issues in education and so that kind of drove me to go back and get my degree. Um, but building relationships all throughout Washington and the Northwest areas with many tribal communities and with the many schools, when I got to here to WSU, it was, um, it was a smooth transition in re research because I had all these hundreds of relationships across the state of Idaho and Washington and schools um, and with funders. And so that's really allowed um, just developing research teams or here at um, WSU a lot easier transition, but more rewarding too. Um, getting into schools are a lot easier because I'm not just now jumping in. I've had these relationships for 15, 20 years. Um, and really committed to building team at work, um, stepping into going from a researcher and faculty to an executive director, um, uh, getting to know my team really well and uh, seeing our strengths and um, weaknesses. And um, I spent a lot of time just had a retreat, um, building one-on-one uh, -on -one time getting to know what they want, what they don't like, because you know you can't move forward if, um, if there's uh, people who are not happy or if they've had some bad experiences. And so I think I've really learned that the process of relationships and building team takes time, but you don't want to forge ahead on a vision until you really have everyone behind you or else you pay on the back end. <laughs> and I've learned that many times, like just don't, don't push it. I, I'm, I'm ambitious and I want to go fast. Um, but it, the relationships matter and the partnerships matter. And so um, moving forward without people, um, even though it takes more time, is not worth it in the end. Um, but then you get loyalty. And so um, I, I love working here at WSU. I have a great um, faculty that I, I collaborate with. I have a great um, team that we work with and a lot of community partners. And it makes my job more rewarding when, when times get really hard and you're like, why am I doing all this? You have those relationships to fall back on. Well, I'll thank all of you, and thank you for uh, staying to your time. I keep making implicit gender comparisons. I, I shouldn't, but I'm just wondering. <laughs> I, you all <laughs> you talked a lot about relationships and values, and I'm, I just keep thinking how it, how it might be different, but that's why we're having this panel to hear from, from female leaders and, and what has worked well for you. We're going to ask several more questions, or, or at least two or three more that we want everybody to answer. We'll see how long those go, but if you are coming up with questions in the audience, you'll have your opportunity in a little bit, but like be writing them down. So if something occurs to you and you don't want to forget about it, do that and we'll, we'll open it up to the audience in a little bit. So the second question is, what is the best advice you have received as you pursued opportunities in your career? And if you are having trouble remembering specific advice from somebody else, you could offer your own advice, something that you uh, tell others. And we could We'll go in a different order. How about um, I'll call you out. We'll start at the other end. Well, I had the privilege of uh, Kelly Ward was one of my first um, chairs when I, I transitioned to WSU uh, four and a half years ago. And she really was a great model on work-life balance. And um, so she gave me the advice. And, and her kids were um, in high school, same time my kids were in high school. And so one, every day, she just asked me how my family was doing. And that, was, that helped my work environment. Um, but she, she would really, um, you know, as a new faculty coming in, you know, really encourage to leave at a certain time, make sure the holidays you spend time with your families during the summer break that you take a chunk of time and um, set that aside. 
Um, the advice wouldn't have meant much if I didn't see her actually doing it <laughs> uh, because it's, it's a practice. Mm -hmm. um, but I think watching her do that, watching her relationship with her family, but then being this ambitious woman that just accomplished amazing goals here at WSU um, and leaving a legacy here, I think really left an impact. And so I really do fight for that um, to, to make sure my weekends, especially are um, with my kids. Um, I may have to work longer during the weekdays, but there's that I take you, most of the time. I try to take Saturday and Sunday so that I'm there with my family and that I can get refreshed to, to start the next week. Um, I'm thinking about advice that I was given sort of in the, the latter half of my career so far when, um, when I was in more leadership roles and asked to do more things and not just be on the committee but maybe lead the committee or take this office or please be chair. And um, I think that the, the thing that helped me the most was to ask myself why, you know, why would I want to do this? Um, and um, what do I want to do with it? Um, because there's a curse of competence, right? Um, if you've done well at one thing, you're going to get asked to do more. And so you're often in the, in the position of making choices, um, and you can't do a good job if you say t yes to too many things, and you can't have a healthy life if you say yes to too many things. So asking myself, what, what is, is this? And in the beginning part of my career, it was a lot about building it, right? I mean, I needed to, and there was lots of advice, pre-tenure in my case, lots of advice about how to do that. But after that, it kind of opened up, like, and I was able to say, well, what is it I want to do? What is the contribution that I want to make in my research, in my leadership? And then kind of say yes to those that actually go in a direction that I want to go because there's lots of opportunities to do things <laughs> more than we should um, so being very thoughtful and deliberate about do I want to do this and for what purpose I think so um, I think I was trying to think about what advice I've gotten over the years and I think it was kind of a combination between what I mentioned earlier in terms of um, some of the you know the skills that I've learned along the way that uh, one of the earliest piece of, it, of advice that I received as a, as a graduate student when I was transitioning into a faculty position was, you know, to, you know, really feel like I owned that role and to step into it and to, you know, to feel that it was mine to begin with. And, and uh, so I've kind of taken that advice early on, but then I've kind of, as I've moved forward in my career, um, I've, you know, tried to you know, instill that in uh, my graduate students um, so that they, you know, feel confident um, uh, from an early stage going forward and uh, that they are, you know, really in control of their career and that they can make those decisions um, and aren't feeling like they have to, you know, uh, appease someone else or go in a certain direction for someone else, um, that they are, you know, in control and able to direct their um, their careers, and I think that would apply to, you know, early career faculty all the way through. So, mm -hmm. so um, I've been given many good advice and some not so good advice as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, um, and I've also taken the very good advice and sometimes I've ignored the very good advice. I think that's maybe something that we should discuss at some point, I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I would say some of the best piece of advice I've of advice I've gotten is to not get all your mentoring in the same place. Um, that that it shouldn't be one person is your is your person. Like you don't have a mentor. That you have a network of of mentors, um, and that you because you just naturally wouldn't necessarily go to the same person uh, for everything in your life, right? And that in a lot of ways you know, you need various pieces of different advice depending on your job, but also, you know, um, your personal situation. I mean, there is everything. I, I always um, like to encourage people to think of themselves as whole human being. Like, oftentimes we're so trained to be the ideal worker that we just shut the door to the rest of us, which is a big part of us, right? Like, the person we are when we get home. The, like, it's we don't actually... You know, we can't actually just close that door. 
and pretend like that person doesn't exist. That person does exist, and you know, you bring her to work with you every day, and therefore you need mentorship for that as well, right? Like, and so you need to have all of these pieces. Um, and I think, you know, kind of getting, um, kind of um, following up on something that something that Zoe said, you know, it's not a one-way stream, it's a relationship that you build, and it's not something that you just go to someone, you're like, you're gonna be my mentor, or will you be my mentor? You know, it's, relationships are very important to me, and so I'm not out to get a mentor, I'm out to meet people and to understand their perspective and to build relationships and hopefully become friends, or, you know, maybe just nice acquaintances that I really like to see, and, um, and in the midst of all of that, I learn a lot about people and I learn a lot about myself and I can take advice. And then next thing you know, you're emailing that person being like, can I talk to you about this problem? Right? Or you're texting that person saying like, can I just vent about my husband? Or, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, slash kid, slash cat, slash, you know, whatever. <laughs> right? And so, and that's, that's really what it is, right? And we all do that, but sometimes we don't see it as a mentoring network. And I think once we start thinking about it, like, oh, I do have this network of support, this network of advice, um, it kind of helps us then move through in a more intentional way about using that network. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of advice I've gotten over the years, but I was thinking um, with this question about two books that I think had a big impact on me. Um, the first one was Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I read that very early in my career. And I recently taught, about two years ago, taught a class on it, and I went back and reread it, and I was like, oh my gosh, my, all these things I've done over my career were because of that book that I didn't remember that's where I'd gotten that advice. So that's a book I really encourage students um, and early career folks to, to read. The other one I think that has been important to me um, has been Lean In, and the reason I bring that up is she talks about instead of a career path being a ladder, being a jungle gym. And I think as part of a two-body problem or dual career couple, you can, um, Kirk has a very traditional path of a ladder where he went step A to step B to step C, and my path has been very different. And I still feel that I've had opportunities, I've grown in that, but there are some people that might say, well, you know, you're not, you're not a department head or a dean or an X or a Y, but my path, I've got done things that I've enjoyed. And I think that's something that's really important, especially today, as we try to balance personal and professional activities or integrate them, they're never balanced, is our expectations of ourself that others put, put, others put expectations on us that we have to go from A to B to C. And I think if you think of a jungle gym where you do lots of different things, you can go down to go up, you can go parallel, and, and that's what I see for my career is doing some of those kind of things and learning and growing and having different leadership opportunities that aren't the traditional A, B, C. I love that. I have so many follow-up questions, but I'm going to hold them for now. Uh, let's go to this, this next question, maybe starting at Noel's end again. Um, I, I really love this one, too. I, I want you all to think about, and hopefully you were able to think about this a little bit before coming, an example of a challenge or a setback that you've experienced on your path and how you addressed it. I don't know if that plays into the jungle gym analogy as well. It may or may not. Um, but I think you know, one of the things I talk to my undergrads a lot about is uh, failure. And I think there's a lot of, when you have this, a panel like this sitting up here, there's a perception that everything just went lockstep for each of you, right? So I think this is a question that's so important for people to hear more about the nitty gritty of your path. So a challenge or a setback and how you overcame that. I love this question, and if I'm the session chair, I use it on alumni, and because I think it's very important, as you said, to see that people have failed. Um, so uh, early in our career, uh, I taught for, Kirk finished his PhD early, and I taught at University of North Dakota as an instructor, and um, for one year, there were no women in engineering. I was the first woman. I got a teaching award. Kirk was an assistant professor, and I had to go back and get my PhD. So. We lived apart for two years. Uh, I was in, in Minneapolis, Kirk was in Grand Forks. He had, a, had Timothy, our two-year-old. And I will get to the story here. I know I'm giving you some <laughs> stuff here. But anyway, 
so they had an opening in electrical engineering at North Dakota, and it turned out nine days after I had Andrew, I had to interview. They required me to interview nine days. Um, the department head was from another culture and was not comfortable with women and picked a friend. And um, this was pretty tough for me. And North Dakota had open access, open HR files. So I actually got to go see the file. And uh, the department head knew if I was acceptable because my husband was also a faculty member, the dean probably. So he said I was unacceptable, that even undergraduates would not, uh, I couldn't even teach undergraduates. And so I made a copy of that. Um, and I kept it in a file, and I used that as motivation any time um, we got another opportunity. And, but any time I needed motivation, I used that to, I had a lot of self-doubt issues for about a year, but I really used that to help motivate me to say, I'm going to show him that he didn't know what he was going to do, do, and I'm going to make him look bad. And um, Kirk wasn't real happy I saved that. He tends to be a glass half full and look at the positives but it was a motivation for me and it also um, you know really helped me reminded me that sometimes when a door closes a window opens and the opportunity we got into was better but at the time it was really tough and so um, I share that kind of as and I agree resumes are terrible because all we we don't put the papers we got rejected the jobs we didn't get on that and, and so you look and you think, oh, this person has just gone from A to Z and it's been easy, and not, that's not true for any of us. So that's an example. Sorry, long story, but. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, I feel like, I mean, everything is a challenge. <laughs> um, so I'm in a jungle gym situation, and I, um, I did not, get to my position in that classic, you know, one move after another. Um, I've done a lot of university level service um, and leadership in that capacity. And when the opportunity arose, I said, that's not for me. Um, but I was lucky enough to have a network of support who convinced me that I could do it. And um, then I said, well, what the heck, um, I'll try it. And it worked. So that's not the challenge part. But the challenge part is that I am an associate professor, um, and I come at this with, you know, not the traditional, like, you know, you do first you do this, and then you do that, and then that builds up to this. And so I'm having to face a lot of, a lot of challenges on the everyday, what I'm having to learn and drink from a fire hose you know, day in and day out, more or less. Um, and I think, and I'm in an interim position, which is a challenge, and next year will be another challenge. And um, what I keep on going back to is, you know, everything is a learning opportunity, right? And so some things I feel I'm like totally rocking, and it's great, and this is my place, and I'm in my zone of genius, and this is great that I got this job because I get to do this, and other things I'm like, you know, can't go to sleep at night because I can't believe I said that. I'll probably won't be able to sleep tonight because I'll think about something I said. <laughs> like, I can't believe I said that, right? And so then you have to, I mean, you have to do what you do, right? Like, you pick yourself up, and you dust yourself up, and you're better luck next time, right? Like, you, or you try not to make the same mistake twice, which I'm sure make the same mistake all the time. But the biggest challenge right now is to balance all the things, right? So, I mean, uh, not just the work and the life, which is always an issue, but, um, and it's not pretty. I mean, I was answering emails when folding, folding laundry last night, so um, I'm not gonna tell you which got the worst end of the stick. <laughs> 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 um, but, like balance, I you know if I if I want to continue and 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 continue in my career, I have to become a full professor for what I want to do, which means that I have to maintain my research agenda, which means that I have to figure things out, make things work, make decisions, have priorities every day for what is the most important thing that has to be done, um, and that's 
not easy and it's not you don't see it right like that's not something that you necessarily see unless you're like my office mate who's like oh her door is op is closed most of the time um and so i don't know that's my current challenge i guess so i would say that um I probably have lots of failures I could talk about, but I'll focus on the challenge for a moment. Um, when, uh, and it's also end with like a lesson that I learned myself just even a month ago. Uh, when I uh, accepted the associate dean position, um, I had uh, explained to the dean that I had uh, a trip to Japan scheduled the day after I took the job and that I'd be back in two weeks. And so uh, I accepted the job and I got on the plane, it was announced, I got on the plane and I got off and I opened my email and as you expect, it, it exploded. And I went, oh, this will be a fun two weeks as I try to do this off schedule. And my phone rang, and uh, it was it was my father, and I'm also a mom, so I have a kid at home. And he was like, "We're moving to Pullman. Um, we need your help." And so, over the last year, I have been, you know, maintaining my lab and my research, and the and and uh, doing the associate dean for research position. You know, the mom as well as caring for two aging parents. And so that has been <laughs> that has been quite a challenge. And about a month ago, I went out after uh, I went out after work one evening with uh, five colleagues and I was like, I just we need to do something fun. And I emailed them an hour before and I said we should all go out and just catch up with each other. And we sat down and it turns out that all five of us we're going through this same exact thing to varying degrees. And I realized right then and there that we should not keep that private, that we should communicate it and, and let other people know because there is a tremendous amount of support out there that probably doesn't, that we probably don't seek out or know about and that many of us are going through those same kinds of integration balance issues um, and that we tend to keep it private and we probably shouldn't and so uh, I recommend that when you're going through all of that that you connect with others because it is incredibly helpful to do so. That's really good. Um, I'm kind of an open book on both the mistakes and the challenges. Mm -hmm. I talk to a lot of people. I just, you know, I find that other people have, um, so I, I, let me back up. Some of my biggest challenges are chronic. It's not an event. It's trying to make something work and I don't have the resources to make it work or I don't have what I need to make it work. So there's a constant adjustment, puzzle making kind of thing going on. And by talking it through with other people, I get ideas. I also get understanding because they get that a lot has to come together for things to work. And so it's a really uh, uh, great exchange of ideas and also just understanding, so, so that's good. When it comes to the major screw-ups, I'm also a big fan of, of naming it, owning it, and, and genuinely just saying, I messed up, I'm sorry. Um, sometimes I don't even know that I messed up, <laughs> you know, and then I have to think, oh wow, you know, even unintentionally I did this and I need to own it and move on. And I think it's part of the very direct and honest way I approach a lot of things um, that I, um, it helps me stay focused and clear, but it also, um, it maintains those relationships. And so I actually can navigate through and have more ideas and more exchange because people know that I'm being straight and that I care and that I will, you know, when I do mess up, I'll say that I did. Um, so they're more willing to give, um, which helps me solve my problems because some of them are too big to solve by myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am my worst enemy. Um, I, I think I really did just stepping into um, working in the academic environment in general. I think there was a lot of messages in my head that I've had to fight. Um, one, I barely graduated high school, so for me to even go back and um, get my PhD was a, a, a big deal, and I didn't really like school growing up, and so, um, but I did it because I, I saw the value in it, and now I love it. Um, 
So stepping in, I, I, the evaluation process as faculty is not the most encouraging um, building up process, and I didn't understand that because I used to be an executive director, and I'd give awesome evaluations, and <laughs> what do you want to grow in? And, and then, I'm, you know, then you have these you know, several page reports that you turn in, and then you get back, and my first um, evaluation was average, average, average. And you know, I've only had worked there for four months, but I was like, I'm failing, <laughs> like I'm only average, what's, what's going on here, you know? And so I literally had to go back and like talk it over and, and say, what does average mean and, and what am I doing wrong? And, um, and so I picked up really quick, they said, well, everyone's average, you know, we, we rate everyone average, and, but if you really, really go overboard, then, then you're, you know, you get up there. So um, I had to really wrestle with that because that wasn't okay to me um, because I, I really felt like I was trying to prove myself. Um, in, in the work, so, um, so every evaluation, and then I have this unique role, so when I got hired, I was originally clinical assistant professor, and then half-time in the Native American programs, because I was a diversity hire, and so I had to, felt like I had to prove myself, um, because I didn't go through the normal hiring process, and, and then people would make comments about that, um, and so I always felt like, well, I need to get more grant money, or I need to do more publications, um, and then I got into an assistant professor role, and only halfway through it, I got offered the, um, the position, or a year into it, um, for executive director. And so then I went into another split role. Um, and so they've been trying to figure out how to evaluate me this whole time, and, um, and I'd, I think I spent too much time and energy trying to help people or, th or think about it myself, how to get evaluated. And it was very, it took away a lot of my joy in my work. Um, every January I would regret it. I just didn't look forward to the process. And then I had to go through this spiraling process again, like how do I build back up my self-esteem? And I even got you know, better and better evaluations, but it still wasn't enough. Um, and also because I have this unique role that they, can't, they don't know how to look at it. So I think um, through all that, um, one, I think friendships, just talking through it, realizing, yeah, there's a lot of people in the same. I'm not the only one that maybe doesn't feel great after an evaluation. <laughs> um, or feel valued um, or feel appreciated for all the extra things you do. Um, and so I think just getting back to what have what am I passionate about, what do I feel good about, and, and, and really even being more positive and giving myself a break. Um, I've had to do that because I felt like, and, and people have said at the beginning, well, just do double to prove yourself that you're, you know, that you're a Native woman that can, and I've had, you know, people challenge me with that, um, and I've had to really figure out, okay, what's right for me, and what, what does it mean to do good work, and what am I, what can I feel good about myself regardless of what people think and feel, but that's a process. I'm still working on it. <laughs> Again, um, I, and my husband's a great, I, I come back and tell him, and I just like, tell me, tell me something good about myself, please. <laughs> um, but thank goodness for friendships where you can just kind of encourage and support each other because we don't really have a realistic picture of all that we do do in this room, um, but we can help each other kind of have a bigger picture, a better picture of ourselves um, that maybe we don't have by ourselves. Thank you for being so candid. I really think we learn the most from these kinds of candid conversations about where our struggles are, and I really appreciate what each of you said to that particular question. I'm going to ask one more question to everyone on the panel and then open it up. So this last one is, I'm gonna give you multiple parts and you can address whichever one resonates with you. It's about mentoring, which we've started to hit on, but either how did you identify mentors along your path and or how were they the most helpful I think sometimes we don't know how to use our mentors. We have mentoring committees in the College of Education, but it's often on the mentee to kind of decide how can I best use this committee, so that part, um, or just what your, has your experience with mentoring been? Zoe, I'll let you start with this one. Uh, well, being hired as a clinical assistant, you don't, originally you don't have a mentor team or you don't get assigned a team, um, but I did ask for one right away because I. Well, one, I research mentoring, so I know it's very important. <laughs> um, so I asked for, you know, can I have a tea? You know, go ahead, go look for somebody and suggest. And um, but I do, I do agree with um, what um, some folks have already said is that it, you just go after building. I mean, obviously, you ask your chair or different people like who would be a good person because I didn't know um, folks that well, so I needed, you know, to know, you know, who would be a good person for me that other people saw but also just um, building great relationships with um, you know, people that I think 
thought would be good so that I'm not a burden on them. I mean, that was important to me that I felt like that I'm giving something to them and it's not just a one-way street. And so um, I think I just started building relationships and, and people that I loved the way they worked and then um, asked them to be on the committee and that, that worked out. Um, Anne is on my committee, which I so appreciate. Um, and But there are different committee members that, you know, you don't need to go to all of them. I've learned that too. It's like you have maybe one person or a core person that you spend a majority of the time that you get feedback from everyone else periodically because we, we are busy and, it, you know, I pr so appreciate those faculty that have, you know, that are kind of um, been there a lot longer, but they take on so much that I really want to be able to give back to them in that way. So being on research projects and things like that has really helped to be on my, um, I think two of my committee members I'm on research projects with. So we get to work in different ways together too, which I appreciate. I, other than my graduate school mentor, I, I would be hard pressed to, to identify people, um, individuals, like this person has been my mentor. I've had thousands of mentoring moments um, by just having conversations with people and a lot of times they are more experienced or they've been through something that, you know, like, oh my gosh, how did you do your first one of these <laughs> in the role or, you know, I'm wrestling with this thing, what do you think, you know, so lots of those conversations and I've, you know, I've reached out to people who were unavailable or not helpful and I usually ask more than one so by the time I do that there's somebody who's kind of talking with it. There's it's people in similar jobs, it's my sister who's not, it's you know, all these different moments of, of kind of thinking things through with people. I guess one insight that I, I have in reflecting on this is that they are not all senior to me. Um, uh, sometimes it's other people going through things at the exact same time. Um, and um, I think of it less hierarchically because of that. Um, that I don't need someone who's been through it all and has all the answers. I, sometimes I just need to bounce ideas or have somebody else share an experience, um, and those can come from a lot of different places. Um, I, like Monica, would have a hard time um, picking out a person or two people that have been those mentors in my life, but when I think about some of the most significant um, kind of events or, or mentor-like uh, situations. Um, it has been, um, wonderfully, it's been people that have surprisingly reached out to me uh, and tried to make a connection uh, and that have really altered my path. And, and so it, that's made me remember over time that um, although we might not be comfortable necessarily always doing that, that reaching out to somebody that you might not know and trying to make that connection can make an enormous difference in their lives. Um, even, you know, I probably am in grad school because I went to grad school because of that. I um, pursued, you know, new areas of research because people who um, weren't necessarily required to, it wasn't a formal mentoring relationship, but reached out and uh, connected with me uh, and offered, you know, advice and, and support in certain areas. And so I try to remember that now to kind of make those uh, moments possible and do that even if it, it um, isn't in a formal mentorship situation. So I already shared my general attitude towards mentoring. Um, I would say two things. Um, the first thing is mentoring is an affirmation. It can be affirmation, but sometimes it's constructive criticism. And I think for me, that's the piece that I was missing for a long time that I'm really glad that I found. I don't need people to tell me how great I am. I mean, I do need people to tell me how great I am. <laughs> and I also need people to say, well, you could do this a little different, or this was a little weaker, and this is, or no, you're not ready for this, and this is what you should be doing, or, you know, uh, and to be a little bit more constructive about that. But the other thing I would say is I would kind of flip it and say we often put it on the mentee to be the person who seeks out mentors. Um, if we're looking at the mentee-mentor relationship as a, as a reciprocal relationship, I want to flip it to you and say it's your responsibility to make sure that you reach out to people, that you bring them to AFW, which, by the way, it was a place where I met many of the people that I would consider mentors. 
right, um, that I'm so glad to see. Uh, Elizabeth here, who's a first year faculty, and I've seen her in a lot of places, and I think that's wonderful, and she's doing everything right. And hopefully someone is, maybe Carrie, encouraging her to come to these things, because it's difficult when you're early in your career, or where you're a graduate student, or where, you know, like, it's, it is difficult, and the fact that we're expecting people to kind of do that, um, seems a little bit counterproductive when like, I can just be the person who's like, hey, why don't you come, right? Or, hey, what's up with you? Like how, you know, what's your story? And tell me about you, so. Yeah, I think two things related to mentors, and I think we've talked a lot about this. I'm not sure there's a certain person. Um, I was at a talk one time and someone said, you know, it's like, are you my mother? The book that kids book are you my mother are you my mentor are you my mentor you know that's not how it's supposed to be and I thought that was a great analogy because sometimes people think you know you're looking for this person and but I think networks are important um, one of the ones is build your own um, when I was in our early career faculty member uh, I actually had a senior woman in in our department which I was fortunate as electrical engineer but there were, weren't early career women like myself. So I sent an email and started a network by, we just went to lunch and then I convinced the dean to pay for lunch for all the women and, and uh, so we did that and, and that was at our life stage because sometimes it's not just at your, your, your technical field but also your life stage, early career, you know, having a one year old and a five year old and trying to get tenure and some of that kind of thing. I also, um, in my professional field, we have, uh, when I started in, in 95, there were five women faculty in power. And so we would have lunch together. I sent an email and we all had lunch together once a year at our conference. Now it's over 35 women and I sent an email and we all get together. Um, the other thing kind of building on what's been said is I really think at any time you should have three networks. One is where you're going, one is where you are, and one is where you've been. And I think it's really important, we think a lot of mentoring as where we're going, but there's a lot of peer mentoring. I mean, sometimes I found out that things I thought I was the only one, I found colleagues like myself, and it wasn't a gender issue, it was being an untenured faculty issue, and sometimes that was helpful. Um, but also I think it's always very important, like Melanie said, to give back to those that are coming um, behind you and make sure you're not always just asking for people to help you, but you're helping those that come behind. So um, those would be the two things is create your own networks and make sure you have all three of those networks because there are times that they're helpful in, in different parts of your life. Mm -hmm. Those are all fantastic. I, I, I'll open it up now and, and perhaps global support can let me know when there might be a question there as well. Would anybody like to start with uh, any question for the panelists? And if others have follow-up questions, A, not all of the panelists have to answer every question, and we can let this progress a little bit more naturally. And then if somebody has a follow-up or related questions, we can engage in more of a conversation as well. So, yeah, yeah. Donna. Oh, yes, I'm going to have to run around. So sexism is pervasive, though maybe lately it's more often dismissed as locker room talk. I was just wondering uh, if you've had experiences that you've had to deal with this and how you handled it. Why is everybody looking at me, right? <laughs> yeah, as, as a woman in engineering, um, you know, I was, uh, I had a, an internship my as an undergraduate at Gen General Motors and um, one of the technicians asked me if I knew how to use a screwdriver and a hammer, and um, I said yes, you know, I, I could, and, and I felt I had to prove myself. Uh, they also, uh, that was back in the 80s, they would have pinups and stuff like that on their carts and things like that, and, um, and I have had some issues when I was uh, early in my career, one of my colleague said, well, are you gonna stay home this summer and take care of your kids? And I said, no, I'm writing research proposals. And, and you know, so I saw some gender differences in that. But um, uh, it is better now in engineering, even though we could have more women, uh, particularly students. But 
there are some things. I found humor is a really good way to, to get back at people um, or to talk to people about something, to try to, in, especially in a group. And the one thing I found is you never embarrass those folks in front of a group because it will, you'll go down a bunch of notches but if you can use humor and then maybe talk to them later about some of those kind of things, that was helpful. Uh, the last thing I will say is you have to decide which battles, which times, which hills to climb. And um, I would say early in my career, I was not as good at discerning that as I've grown uh, uh, through lots of examples is figuring out which, which battles to make in that. Does anyone else want to address that one? I had a pretty serious situation, um, and so I don't. I won't get into too much of it. But um, you know, I think in general, you you just notice when when men eyes look down or when they're talking to you and they're not looking at the right place. Um, but I think a more serious situation. It was a, a actual person that I had, was on a research team with, and I learned really quickly. Like you know, when you're uh, traveling research conferences and you're presenting that um, you just boundaries of just not having dinner afterwards and those types of things because it just was it turned into I think appropriate behavior on his part um, the the benefit was I mean I was it was a long-term friend and I think it was just the way he behaved generally it wasn't like me personally it was just the way he tra treated women um, and finally I was able to I mean after that trip I was so uncomfortable that I called him on the phone, didn't talk to him in person, but just, just said how inappropriate it was. And then I talked to my husband, and my husband would also like to talk to him. <laughs> and, um, and my husband did, he got on the phone, and he said, don't you ever um, treat my, you know, my wife like that again. And then they were friends, they knew each other too. So I think it was, and I normally wouldn't bring my husband into something that, other than there was a history and relationship. And I think it was good for him to have to face um, some uh, basically apologize not only to me but to to my my husband and um, and so that was that was good it was uncomfortable though it was hard and and he did change after that um, and he did apologize and he said hey, I don't think it's just you I've had a history of um, you know treating women this way and I, I haven't even realized it but there was several situations that brought it to light granted he ended up getting fired from his job later on so um, for that very reason, so yeah, but it was it, it was difficult because I was in a lower position than him, and I was felt very dependent. I mean, it was a grant. We were on a grant. There was a lot going on, so it was kind of a scary situation for me. Um, but uh, dealing with it made me feel a lot better, and I, I was actually a lot of times people do give a good response back. Not always, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, thank you for that response because I think you know we've had this growing recognition that. Uh, we can now do something about it, right? I think mm -hmm. that's where we are now, but we often don't know what exactly that thing is, whether it's in the workplace or conferences and, mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. We are planning a sexual harassment event for February, so we won't get into too much of the nitty gritty here because there's so much to mm -hmm. dive into, but I think we're gonna take it a step further so that there'll be more information we can provide to women at WSU. That's a great, great example. Another audience question. I mean, really, if you don't have one, I really want, I've been dying to know what the bad advice was that Melanie got, so <laughs> I, I will throw that out there. And while, while we're waiting for the pause, think of your next question. Are you willing to share? Or anybody's bad advice? I mean, I, I thought that was a great thing to bring up. Well, or good advice you didn't take, or yeah, anything, or you kind of those, those. Right, I mean, so some of, the, some of the bad advice I've gotten, I'm not gonna share the details because it would be identifying, um, but I think that bad advice would have been mitigated if I had had a broader mentoring network, including mentors that would have been outside of my department. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I think in that regard, I mean, I guess I can say I was, I was ill-advised on some of the expectations for my tenure, um, you know, which is a really bad thing <laughs> to get bad advice on. Um, I mean, I've gotten bad advice on shoes and things like that, but <laughs> um, the good advice I didn't take is, I mean, it's basically always boils down to learn how to say no, and I s still don't know. 
Does anyone else want to tackle that kind of theme about the, the bad advice or well, things what, not to do? One of the things when I talk to people is, you know, as a, as a scientist engineer, you want multiple data points mm -hmm. and then you draw a line through the, you take the average, right? And so I said, don't just take my advice. I said, talk to multiple people and get multiple people's perspectives. Because we all have different personal situations, backgrounds, and all that. And getting just one person's advice, they may not have the right advice um, or you know something like that. So I think um, that's a big thing is to get multiple pieces of advice and then decide where you draw the line related to your data. And you know, one piece of advice, you can draw the line anyway. And um, so that's why I think it's important to get multiple perspectives on things to help you see where you fit into that. Yeah, I like that. And both the mentee and the mentor can take responsibility for that. So you seek out multiple perspectives mm -hmm. as well as doing that. We have an online question. How do you deal with imposter syndrome? <laughs> That's a good question. How do you? <laughs> well, I can say that I still deal with imposter syndrome. So um, about five years ago, five or six years ago, a colleague came to me and said, Noel, we want to nominate you for fellow. I said, you know, I'm not ready yet. I don't have everything I need for this. And she goes, we can do it with or without you. It'll be easier for us if you help. <laughs> so I said, OK. So I gave her my materials. And I was fortunate I became a fellow. And I'm just like, you know, I kind of do what I say, not what I do. So mm -hmm. I think it's really important to have a support network, to have someone that you can talk to about these things. Um, related to that. Um, the other thing is to not make rash decisions that mm -hmm. when something happens, don't make a decision that day, sleep on it, talk to a colleague, um, your support network. I'm fortunate that, that my partner is, is a lot of, has been a lot of that over my career. But um, so, you know, I think imposter syndrome, you just have to have a support structure and that's the most important thing that you've got to do. Um, I would say don't spend your time comparing yourself to other people. Or if you're going to do that, compare yourself to people that are like less advanced than you, not more <laughs> advanced than you. So I like to run, and for the longest time, I would only compare myself to my friends who run like sub three marathons. And, like, and I finally realized that I probably shouldn't do that because clearly I'm never going to be that person, nor do I actually want to be that person. Right? So, I mean, same, same thing for a lot of areas. I mean, I think it's helpful to have aspirations and to have role models, but we don't need to compare ourselves in that kind of way. I can be your running comparison. I don't run. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing is I have to be faster than the slower person so the zombies won't eat me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Courtney, we'll, you'll get eaten. <laughs> and the remaining panelists do not have imposter syndrome. <laughs> I would say that the act of preparing usually gives me more confidence if I'm ever feeling underconfident about something. As I start to sort of think, what is it I need? What don't I know yet? I actually, it's a, a self-helping process. And I think for me, it's, it's making sure I align my work to where I feel like my my strengths are and um, where I can really contribute um, because it's true when I was first hired here I'm like I, I'm in um, a, a discipline that my field of research and what I do is very different from the rest of my discipline and so um, and they're all quantitative I was only a qualitative researcher and indigenous researcher so I'm just drastically different um, so I've really had to, one, align my work goals and my, my work and, and my connections and relationships more along the lines of my field of research and my areas of expertise. And, um, and that's helped a lot. You know, I'm I, part of an indigenous center research network and, um, 
and then you know I go in and I do things a little bit more similar. It's, so it's not about a comparison, or but it's I I belong there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, AERA um, is our educational research with 16,000 people. Well, I go to the pre conference with the Indigenous peoples. Um, so those different things helped me connect over time. I work for Native American programs. <laughs> There's hardly any Native faculty or staff, but just that little bit of connection allows me to feel like, okay, I do belong here. And that's something I'm committed to um, as we, we, you know, diversify our faculty is that, especially with Native faculty, that we, any Native faculty comes in, that we try to provide a support network because you do need those connections. Um, whatever field or, or, or person, wherever you come, if you don't belong, you know, the, reeling, the reality, sometimes we don't belong in a certain area, um, but there, there's places that we do belong, and so those help strengthen us so that then when we venture out, you know, we, we feel like we, we have a connection. Yeah, and I'll add, um, so we brought it up, is like AFW is a great example of finding a place to belong, mm -hmm. and organizations like that over my career have helped uh, with my imposter syndrome because I, I feel I belong. Mm -hmm. Are there any other audience questions? Just waiting for dinner, dinner conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So my question has to do with really what Melanie, you had sort of alluded to, this idea that one of the ways to move up here and maybe at other universities um, is that people get, women get tapped before they become full. Um, so, what advice, now that you're here, <laughs> what advice would you give to faculty and women here who may be tapped, because there are a lot of leaders here that are, um, that are right for that? I would say one really critical thing is ask for what you need. There are times when it, you know, after talking with everybody, getting the ideas and weighing it, the answer might be no, I'm not going to do this. But when it is, I need to do this or I want to do this, I would think very carefully about what it is I need to make that work, um, including protected time or resources or mm -hmm. a number of things that could happen um, or political cover or, you know, whatever it is that, that you will then have to navigate because you're at a certain career stage in the in the you know in the promotion rank. I'd give some thought to that and ask for it. Mm -hmm. um, I think oftentimes um, uh, in the process of thinking that through, we strategize, but also we might be better equipped on the other side to be successful while trying to do more than one thing. Um, I, th I think uh, it was a great advice to what resources do you need? Um, one of the things I talk about with when, when someone of a power comes to you and asks you to do something, like your department head or, or you're an untenured faculty member, um, is, is saying, okay, this is what I have on my plate. Which thing do you think is less important that I should do this activity instead of that activity? Mm -hmm and have them help you make that decision, but help make sure they're giving, taking something off your plate if they're gonna put something on your plate, I think is a very important thing. And when it's your department head asking you to be on a committee, well, if this is so important to you, then what are you gonna take away from me? And, and I think it kind of puts it back in that you're not making that decision, that that person that's in power has to make that decision and they may say, well, I really need you on that other committee. And you're just like, well, I, you know, I just don't think I can do that right now, given that. Um, I was an associate professor and um, doing some administrative activities. And, and actually, in my case, I got kicked out of the dean's office because my husband became dean and the provost wouldn't let me work in the dean's office. Um, which I was really mad at at the time because I was the first Schultz in the dean's office. But um, anyway, <laughs> um, but when I went back, I ended up um, doing getting my research to a point and, and getting full professor, which is giving me some other opportunities. So in my case, I got kicked out of it. So it, I can't say that I was prepared and made the decision myself. Um, I do think um, it's very important um, for women to get go towards a full professor, 
some of our new advance um, activities will be now first way it was getting women into the profession and getting us tenure but now we do have that women get asked to be in that position um, the one thing I would suggest is possibly looking at a finite time and agreeing with with your the leader that I will do this for three years but really I'm committed to get full professor and it's in my best interest and it's in your best interest for that that's hard because I tend to like the administrative activities more than I did the research activities but in the long run I'm glad I did that I'm not saying I was always happy about it but but I do think that's something and it's a very good point um, as we we see that um, in in making sure you have the resources you have the opportunity and and making sure whether it's maybe a postdoc or a graduate student or helping pay an assistant you know what are those resources that you need to get that step and even if you've already committed if you're going to stay in that position I think you can talk to your boss and say hey I really need this for me I need this for the other women in our department and college when you're in college and university positions and how are you going to help me do this and uh, I think that's what you've got to do is ask for those resources I think that's a perfect place to bring this part of the program to a conclusion and I just I, I learned so much from all of you so this <laughs> this part of answering the questions as our panel has been wonderfully informative um, we're looking forward to segueing into a dinner but before we do that I just want to say a few words about AFW because almost everything they said are things that you really can get from AFW and it's been so invaluable to me to a we're forming relationships we're forming community which Zoe talks so much about you're finding mentors you're finding mentees you're getting connections to places all over campus and learning how the university works um, I feel like there was one other one I was going to say but all of it and just just meeting people period and hearing from from wonderful leaders at our university um, like we had here today so I encourage you to keep keep doing that and thank you for being here so if you RSVP for dinner I hope many of you are staying to interact more with our panelists over dinner the dinner is ready and you can transition through that doorway to get something to eat we'll maybe form some little um, seating areas with these chairs as well as use those tables and there's a bathroom across the breezeway here so just right across and turn left, there is a, a bathroom there if you need that. Is that everything? Are we good to Global? Thank you everybody else who tuned in on Global and for your question and yeah, we'll sign off. <laughs>